Okay. <clears throat> so this evening, um, the discussion is what is meant by prayer in a Buddhist context. And prayer is common to all religious traditions, including non-formal, local, or folk religions. Uh, examples of folk religions include African traditional religions, Chinese, Native American and Australian Aboriginal religions. Even they have, have prayers. And prayer takes many forms depending on the focus and the variety of the religion. So it is with the Buddhist path. We will start with the general agreed upon meaning of prayer and then go deeper into what is meant by Buddhist prayer, specifically recognizing that Buddhism is an aspect of a larger cultural milieu which is reflected in Buddhist practices. Now I've tried to keep this evening's formal presentation shorter so we have more time for informal discussion at the end. Next, please. <clears throat> Dictionaries define prayer as a request for help or expression of gratitude directed to saints, God, or other godlike beings. And prayer is the central devotional activity of many religions. The simplest and most basic form of prayer is petition, and the Greek word for prayer, yuke, implies a wish or a demand. It also carries the connotation of a vow. And so therefore, when we think of prayer, often we think of supplication. We think of petitioning, or we think of asking for something. But in fact, from the very, from the word, uh, the, the origin of the word, it really has to do with, with vow, and it has to do with a demand as opposed to supplication. And there need not be a deity or a God for there to be a prayer. And here I think that that's one of the things that uh, really confuses people who, especially Euro, Euro American folks who come from a monotheistic background, they associate prayer with God, capital G, God, monotheistic God. And therefore, they make the assumption that, well, there's no God specifically in Buddhism. That is to say that, it's, that, that Buddhism is non-theistic. But that means that there's no Abrahamic God that's to be addressed. And so prayer can be addressed in a more abstract fashion, something such as something that's greater than oneself, the cosmic consciousness. But actually, there doesn't have to be a... Uh, petition to something or someone for there to be a prayer. Prayer has a much broader uh, meaning than that. Prayers can take the form of thanksgiving, gratitude, or request to the unknown to answer questions of a personal nature and assist those in attaining clarity. And as we'll see in a few minutes, one can make an appeal to the ineffable for solace, forgiveness, repentance, compassion, and direction. I mean, when we stop and, and really look at what is human, people will address something when they're in, in crisis. It doesn't necessarily have to be a God. It's, woe is me. They're not asking specifically like a, like a God, woe mm -hmm. is me. Why is this happening to me? Um, I had, a, you know, if someone has a child die, they may... Uh, wonder, well, what is the meaning of, of this life if one has one's child? I'm just using it as an example. And that doesn't mean that they expect an answer from something or someone. That's a different prospect. prospect. Next, please. So let's look at a Buddhist perspective. Anyway, so from a Buddhist perspective, Prayer is an aspiration to engage the life of all sentient beings, whether through consciousness, a sharing, or a giving, loving kindness. It allows us to turn our hearts and minds to the beneficial and rouse our thoughts and actions toward awakening. That's very specific to Buddhism. And prayer provides us a frame of reference to address the difficulties in this world in a way that can lead us to action. I mean, the first, no the first noble truth is life is dukkha. And by that very nature, it means that there, are, there is a way of looking at the world around us that, rec that recognizes the difficulties that are inherent in being alive. When done on a regular basis, prayer can be a function as a form of self-talking in which one mentally talks through a problem or talks through it aloud in the hope 
that some new insight will arise. The first time I was in Japan, which is now almost 40 years ago, it's pushing 40 years, um, and watched my mother-in-law and Tamami go to the Butsudan to pray, I'm not sure what I expected. It's not that prayer was foreign to me. I prayed often in a Jewish context, and I participated in prayers in Buddhism by chanting, etc. However, the prayers that were being offered at the Butsudan were a bit different than in that the two people were speaking, that is to say my mother-in-law and Tamami, were speaking, and later I learned to their family members. I really didn't think about that because it's not typical within my tradition that one would have a conversation with one's deceased parents. That seemed to be a bit different. Um, they were talking to the family members whom they had known and they were offering their love. They were asking for direction about things that concerned them at the time. And that really takes on the role of a dialogue so that in the case of being at the Butsudan, there's almost a dialogue. You say, well, who's answering? Well, in a sense, it's being answered in one's own mind. One is saying something and you're open to what is there. Now, people may have read in the Shingi several months ago when I discussed being at the Butsudan in Arhondo in the morning, and I addressed my parents, grandparents, giving them thanks. And I gave thanks specifically to the Native Americans who live on this land before Tamami and I arrived, asking them to look over our shared environment. They were a tribe of the Lene Lenapes, which means original people, a part of the Machican peoples of Native Americans in North America. And to do that really felt appropriate. That I don't think of the land on which we're living right now as being our land. This land was here before the Europeans arrived. There were peoples who lived on this land before we arrived. And so as I sit in the in the boots in the uh, hondo in front of the butsudan it's not that i'm really saying something to them per se i would not know what they look like for instance but there's a sense of thanksgiving that i'm providing to them for having been on this land and we have to remember that it wasn't their land per se either rather it was a gift of the earth to all of us. And so there's a sense of thanksgiving that's broader than just the, the Lene Lenape people who lived here before us. It's larger than just my parents and grandparents. It really has to do with the continuity of life of which we are a part. And so when I'm in front of the Butsudan, I'm not saying that this is the way it is done in Japan like those two kids in front of the Butsudan in that particular um, photo. But that's how I'm interpreting that process, because that's what becomes meaningful for me. And that is by way of a prayer. And so prayer, therefore, frequently has the function of being part of Shmirti, Buddhist mindfulness. Prayer can be a, a, a type of meditation in order to center oneself on the Buddhist teachings in a very informal way that speaks to the kokoro, heart, mind, and spirit. And it's special, it is especially powerful because one drops the self and speaks sincerely without worrying about connotations. Next, please. If we're dealing with Buddhist prayer, we learn, share, and reflect on the insights, experiences, and wisdom of others. This includes recitation of, of repentances, chanting sutra, repeating vows, such as the four bodhisattva vows, etc. When we are reminded how blessed we are, by the recitations and chanting, we remind ourselves that we are in a sacred trust with the earth, the various figures, and on a path that provides us with a means of liberation from delusion. And it's a practice of inner development, and the inner self is about what can't be seen, feelings, intuition, values, beliefs, personality, thoughts, emotions, fantasies, spirituality, desire, and purpose. A strong inner self means that you cope well with your emotions, you are self-aware, have clarity, 
and a good sense of your values and feel a purpose in life. It also means that you're able to remain calm and resilient in the face of adversity from the outer world. That's all part of that inner development that I think prayer cultivates. And it activates a pathway between the conscious and the unconscious mind. Now, conscious and unconscious are used in Freudian and Jungian psychology, as well as other forms of psychology. And I'm not going to develop, delve into psychology here. But I'd like to use the terms without the baggage that they carry. So don't think of them in the formal psychological context. The brain is a complex organ that controls thought, memory, emotion, touch, motor skills, vision, breathing, temperature, hunger, and every process that regulates our body. We think of this brain when we are referring to the intellect. However, in this case, I'm speaking of Kokoro, as I was speaking of before, the heart, mind, spirit. The Maka Shikan by Chigi makes reference to this time and time again, but in the sense that it can penetrate, that is, the, the Kokoro, can penetrate what cannot be penetrated by the intellect alone in the brain. That's over and over again we find that, that context, in, not only in the Makashikan, but in Buddhist writings in general, but we see it especially there. Prayer, along with meditation and several other Buddhist practices, can do what our brain alone cannot. It is an offering and a veneration. We do this with the mantra to Yakshin Yorai in the Honzon, Hogo, the recognition of our ancestors, Shakyamuni Buddha emphasize the primacy of individual practice and experience. It's reported that he said that supplication of gods and deities was not necessary. Nevertheless, today, many lay people in East Asia continue countries, as well as Tibet, countries pay, pray to the Buddha or a deity in ways that resemble Western prayer, asking for intervention and offering devotion. A mantra is often used, a sacred expression in Sanskrit believed to have spiritual powers, and the meditation with the mantras makes a connection with divas, bodhisattvas, and other figures, a kind of joining of consciousness. There are many other forms that this type of prayer can take, but I'll leave that for now. Next, oh, let me, Before we go on, I'd like to read the, um, the piece that's there, um, which is the prayer that I included here is an example of a, pray, of a prayer, and you can see it's not to a deity or a god or something along those lines, but it is, a, it is a to the cosmos, if you will, or something that's larger. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is sourless. And may all live in equanimity without too much attachment and too much aversion. And live believing in the equality of all lives. And in, in a, if we were to transform this into a Judeo Christian Abrahamic sense, it would be may God provide us with happiness, may, and the, the causes of happiness, may et cetera, et cetera. In this case, it's just may all beings, may, et cetera, et cetera. And so that, I think, demonstrates a distinction between if one is praying to an Abrahamic God, monotheistic being, versus the Buddhist context. Hold on just a minute. i got to find where I was again. Prayer and Buddhist practice. Many of the things that we do as Buddhist practice, such as chanting, recitation, and sutra, are in fact forms of prayer. We don't think of it that way. If we recite the Heart Sutra, we're reciting the Heart Sutra, and I know that many of us um, are, how many times have we recited, how many times have we seen it? We know it on one hand, reciting it reminds us of the elements that, it's, that it is, inherent in it, such as shunyata, um, the idea that avokitsavara, bodhisattva doing prajnaparamita, deprajnaparamita samadhi, could recognize the cause of her suffering, and as a result, cease to suffer. That's part of the message of that particular, of that particular sutra. But at the same time, 
by reciting it, we are venerating the teaching and we are enabling ourselves to feel one with the teaching and one with other people in the room because we recite it all together. And so it has a purpose that's larger than just whatever the intellectual meaning is on the page that we would just read and, and we could do a, an analysis or whatever of it. So um, that is a form of prayer. And the purpose of Buddhist prayer is to awaken our inner abilities for strength, resilience, compassion, and wisdom. It's a spiritual dialogue that helps one to center mentally and emotionally. And we pray for the joy and well-being of one's family and friends, all sentient beings, and the earth. These three items are self-evident from the earlier discussion. Next, please. So, in conclusion, I told you it was going to be short. The last time I presented a prayer, uh, a discussion on prayer was about three years ago, and I chose to do it again because of the perception of Euro-Americans who maintain that Buddhists do not pray. They claim that it is not a feature of Buddhism. Some Buddhists believe this, and they're mistaken. In Buddhism, we do pray in many ways for the inspiration and strength to work on ourselves so that we can create our own cause of joy, as well as the benefit of others as much as possible. It's not that we wave a magic wand and all of a sudden we have some special power to do it, but by the process of prayer, we can accomplish small and great things. We receive consolation and succor. We have insights that are filled with confidence. We are connected to the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, and other elements of the cosmos. It reminds me of a quote by Mother Teresa, and it is, quote, I used to believe that prayer changes things, but now I know that prayer changes us, and we change things. That's the point. It's not that I seek to change things with prayer. It is to me, I seek to change myself when I pray. And I'd like to end with a quote from It Sounds Too Good to Be True by Mark Uno. It's easy to forget that the ultimate real, and this is a quote, it's easy to forget that the ultimate realization is boundless compassion and oneness. When we put our, hand, our palms together, it is not just one pair of hands meeting palm to palm. Paying close attention, it is as if we can feel the gentle touch of our teacher or the Buddha herself her palms gently caressing the back of our hands, helping bring our palms together, teaching us the feeling of boundless compassion and wisdom. In that moment, whether we live or die, achieve health or not, become enlightened or not, become secondary to the knowing power of the Buddha nature is always present, that everything we need is between the palms as we bow, that the working of great compassion is already unfolding here and now. And we can call that prayer if we like. And the final uh, prayer that you see here is by Shanti Deva, and uh, Ichishima Sensei might want to say something about that. Bodhisattva prayer for humanity. May I be a guard to, for those who need protection, a guide for those on the path, a boat, a raft, a bridge for those who wish to cross the flood. May I be a lamp in the darkness, a resting place for the weary, a healing medicine for all who are sick, a vase of plenty, a tree of miracles, and for the boundless multitudes of living beings, may I bring sustenance and awakening, enduring like the earth and sky, until all beings are freed from sorrow and all are awakened. I think that's a really good prayer to end this um, section on prayer with. So those who think there is no prayer in Buddhism, explain what Shantideva is saying in that particular uh, passage. Next, please. And of course, I couldn't resist. In a session like this, I have to have a praying mantis. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we'll open it up for unmute people and open it up for questions and answers. Yeah, and um, also, um, we'll unmute you. and stop the recording too. And we'll stop the recording at this point. Yeah. Oh, hold, before you stop the recording, hold on a second. Yeah. Uh, Ichishima Sensei, did, 
Would you like to add anything to what we were talking about? Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, you mentioned about uh, Shandeva's Bodhicharya uh, uh, avatar. I like it very much. Um, Shantideva, around the uh, seventh to eighth centuries in India, uh, he's, uh, I think his uh, Bodhicharya avatar is a very excellent one guiding us to enlightenment. Uh, uh, he was really, uh, of course, representing Madhya Mika uh, line of Nagarjuna, uh, but his practice of meditation is quite amazing. I think uh, uh, world classics, uh, Bodhicharya Avatara Shandeva, you can find it, uh, some library or bookstores. So as a Buddhist, uh, we should read it. Uh, that is really basic understanding of prayer, uh, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now I will stop the recording. Okay. Now we'll stop the recording.